Welcome to week three of my fitted wardrobe build. Coming up today, we've got construction and installation of the top boxes, a little bit of painting, strengthening the carcasses to prevent that sagging in the middle, and construction and installation of the carcass fascias. In week one, I ran through most of the tools that I'll be using on this build, and you'll find those in the description below this video. But during this week, certain tools really came into their own. My new Urbauer plunge saw, my DIY cyclone dust extractor, these saws, my glue gun, and the return of my brilliant little Ryobi circular saw. Now, I've had enough of the dust spewed out by my Evolution circular saw, so I decided to invest in a plunge saw and picked up this Urbau from Screwfix for £149 last week. I'm going to do a separate video at the end of the build because I think it's really important to have a discussion on the merits of plunge saws against circular saws, but suffice to say I've really enjoyed using this plunge saw this week. It comes with two 700mm tracks, which bolted together completely true, unlike my Evolution. And it also fits my Evolution tracks. Although it will remove more of the splinter guard than the evolution saw did, so in the unlikely event that I want to use that evolution saw again on its tracks, I will need to get a new splinter guard. I picked up this one, this Makita splinter guard, last week just in case. It's quieter than the evolution. The two clamps that come with it work fantastically well. It's easier to adjust the depth of the blade, and you'll see I've rather crudely written my most often used depths on the side of the saw itself. And with the blade removal window blocked up, which was one of your suggestions, almost no dust was emitted. Oh, and one of the criticisms of this saw is the anti-kickback mechanism, so I removed this straight off before using it. With no dust going into the vacuum now because of the cyclonic extractor, check out last week's video on this, I can now vacuum up absolutely everything, including all the saw dust that fell on the floor. And I've been connecting whatever tools I can to it whilst working on these carcasses. Annoyingly, it doesn't come with a bag, so I bought this one from Triton to keep it in, which is fine, but it doesn't quite shut with everything inside. And so we start today's update on the top boxes. The first job was to start at the right-hand side of the room where my uneven ceiling is at its lowest, to get the top box as close to the ceiling as possible, as this will maximise the height of the other top boxes, which obviously have to follow the dimensions of this one. What you just saw was the crucial dimension I needed to complete the top of the box, and then it was onto the sloping section which had two angles to cut. The first of which was a straightforward cut on the plunge saw, but the second was too acute for the saw, so the remainder had to be removed by eye with my Bosch electric planer. I then dry fixed the box together with a combination of standard wood and Spax MDF screws. Just as well I didn't use glue because I found it easier to paint the inside of the box with the sloping section removed. More on painting in a minute. As with the main carcasses, the rear of the top box is made from 12 rather than 18mm MDF. And I rounded over the top edge so that it fit better into the slope of the ceiling with my vintage Stanley block plane and my Ryobi random orbit sander. I also cut a hole in the base with this Bosch 38mm multi-material hole saw to coincide with the routed channels on top of the main carcass to thread the lighting wires through into the top box. With the trickier sloping carcasses constructed, the other three standard rectangular top boxes could be quickly put together, rather like I constructed the main carcasses in part two of this video series. All the lighting cables had to be fixed into their channels before I could slide each top box into position, and to keep them tidily in their respective cable runs, I temporarily fixed them down with small blobs of glue from my glue gun, and then, starting with the furthest right top box, I slid each box into place, carefully threading the wiring into and under each top box through those holes you just saw me drill as I installed them. I then screwed the main and top box carcasses together at the front, drilling a shallow pilot hole with a 6mm drill bit to enable the wood screw to self countersink so the hole can be filled. And so we're on to painting. What I've realised is that if I'd been really organised I would have painted each individual section of carcass before putting it together, but I wasn't, and at least these carcasses will be relatively easy to paint in situ. And I did paint around the sensor housing and LED strip connector input before installing these lighting components. But the top boxes would have been a complete pain to paint afterwards, so with all the components cut, I set about priming them with Zinza BIN one cold, wet evening in my brilliant tented workshop, and then top coated them with this Johnston's acrylic eggshell mixed to a Farron Ball colour Hague Blue. I had to bring the carcasses in from the tent, as with the heating on and freezing temperatures outside, I had a few drips of condensation onto the newly painted surfaces in a few places. 
which I've since sorted by putting a few foam packaging strips in the affected areas. I've done a few videos in the past on painting MDF, but these days Zinza Bin is my go-to primer for pretty much everything. But I did find the top coat scratched a little bit too easily on these top boxes just after I painted it, which a decorator friend says could be because the top coat is water-based and it really needs five to seven days to properly harden. Admittedly, it scratched when the bits were rubbing up against each other before I'd put them together. But I've also heard a lot of good things, particularly from you lot, about the water-based Zinza Bullseye 123. So I bought a tin from Screwfix this week. And as Zinza themselves recommend this for MDF, next week I'm going to paint these carcasses with it and see how it compares. The other point to make is that I'm always experimenting with paint rollers and I wasn't particularly impressed with the finish I got from this Purdy Jumbo mini frame roller sleeve which admittedly I shouldn't have used because it's more suited to enamels and clears. So next week, I'll be trying this Lime Series roller from Axis Decor, which I got from eBay. and possibly comparing it also against the 100% wool or simulated mohair roller sleeves that in the past have been a favorite of mine for jobs like this. Stopping the double width carcasses from sagging has been on my mind for some time. The solution I came up with was two four meter lengths of three by 30 millimeter metal banding from my local agricultural stroke DIY store, as these provide real stiffness and can be hidden behind the wardrobe fascia. The top band needed a wedge cut off it for it to fit to the uneven ceiling. And whilst not really necessary, I wire brushed the rust off them. They had been stored outside at the shop. And after drilling countersunk holes for the screws, gave them one coat of Bonda rust primer. I then screwed these to the front of the wardrobe carcass with my Spax MDF screws. Locating them centrally on the carcass left three millimeters below and above. So I was confident I could route a groove in the back of the fascia with a three millimeter lip top and bottom to completely hide these metal bands. Which brings us nicely onto the final section of this video, construction of the carcass fascias. I've built a few cupboards and wardrobes over the years, but ever since laying eyes on these in my old day job, I've been really keen to incorporate a beaded edged fascia on this wardrobe project. This has the dual function of hiding the MDF carcass end grains, but also elevates the build to, I think, a more professional level and is quite easy to achieve. I took a few lengths of five by one inch redwood purchased at the start of the project from buildingmaterials.co.uk, realizing that I could get three 36 millimeter wide fascias out of each plank. And I reached again for my Ryobi circular saw. Now people are gonna to beg to differ with me on this, I'm sure, but I prefer to use the fence rather than the saw track for this type of cut as a minute inaccuracy positioning the track or perhaps with the way the track's even bolted together and the cut will be out. I should have perhaps tried out my Urbao plunge saw, which has a fantastically comprehensive looking fence, but with the Ryobi saw blade on the other side of the machine in close proximity to the fence, I just feel I have so much more control over the cut with this configuration. With the net result that I got my face just bang on to the 36 and a half millimeter width that I was after. So with the strips cut down to size, it was time to route the decorative edge. Now I don't have a router table and my half inch shank Dewalt router is just too big, heavy and cumbersome to route something delicate like this. And so that's where my quarter inch shank Ryobi trim router comes in. It's been a DIY game changer for rebating hinges, cutting these grooves for the lighting and now the fascias. I bought this beaded edge quarter inch shank router bit from Wilden Tools. I made a few mistakes on my early efforts, if I'm honest, basically because each time I stopped to reset my clamps, the slightest movement produced a jar in the edge. I minimized this in the end by screwing a piece to the back of each fascia so that I had an immovable bed to run the router along without it tilting and by clamping it along its length in such a way that I didn't have to keep stopping to reposition the clamps. With this set up, the only thing you've got to remember is to walk smoothly down the length as any stumble can cause the router to wobble. Now clearly a router table would have made this job so much easier, but I'm trying to show how you can achieve effects like this with a DIY approach. Next job was to route out the rear of the horizontal fascia that fronts the main carcasses and top boxes. To accommodate that metal strip I had screwed on to strengthen the double carcasses. I did this with a hinge mortise I bought from Wilden Tools for my door hanging video, using the fence to keep the router in line during the cut. With all the fascias now routed, I had to remove beading at each intersection of the fascia and to make my life easier here, I made two jigs that I could slot the fascia into to make each cut consistent. 
I started off with my Irwin Jack floorboard saw with its ultra fine teeth. However, halfway through, I thought I'd try out my Japanese shakunin saw, which I did a video on a while ago. The teeth on this Tatsubiki makes Irwin's look clumsy by comparison, and it achieved a far more accurate cut that required minimal fine tuning. Unlike English swords, their cut works on the pull rather than the push stroke, although at 39 pounds compared with 10 pounds for the Irwin, they're not cheap. The vertical sections of the fascia where they intersected the metal band also needed a minor rebate. Another job for the Tatabiki saw. As I couldn't easily screw through the metal strengthening bars, I decided to glue the fascias into position on these bars using my glue gun. A link to my recent video on this is on screen now. Loaded with a 45 second glue stick. This proved to be pretty effective, and so I ended up using it for all the fascias, although in hindsight, the 180 second glue sticks might have been more appropriate as I made a few minor positioning errors because the glue went off too quickly for me to finish positioning the fascias. The exception was the top fascia where I used a combination of glue and these lost tight screws as a redwood had warped quite badly overnight with most of its structure removed by all the routing, which inevitably happens when the wood is brought in from outside into a heated environment. Which brings us on to the scribing. The top and side fascias had to be scribed to my uneven walls and ceiling and around the skirting. Where the fascia butted up to the wall, I used these swanky scribes which I was kindly sent free of charge recently by the inventor. So thanks Neil for those. Depending on what needs removing and how uneven it is, my jigsaw, block plane and belt sander tend to be the main tools in my armoury for getting that scribe section to really accurately hug the wall. For the skirtings I used my profiling gauge and this finer blade on my jigsaw to get round the angles and then in a moment of complete stupidity I cut off the wrong piece of the scribe which then had to be glued and screwed back on with a filler piece to make up the shortened length. The curved section was too wide for the swanky scribe so I made my own scribe and glued the section itself temporarily in position with my glue gun. I then removed the scribe section with my jigsaw and fine tuned it with my block plane and belt sander and a few filler pieces glued to the inside of the carcass to keep the fascia square and to give me something to glue onto. Which I also did for the top fascia. So that's it for today. I've got a bit of sanding and filling to do with the fascias, which I'll do at the start of the next video, in which I'll also be cracking through the drawers and the shelves. Don't forget, details of everything I've mentioned today will be in the description below the video, which you can access on your smartphone by clicking on the little arrow and on your PC by clicking on the show more button. If you've liked today's video, it'd be great if you'd give it the thumbs up below. And if you're new to my channel, it would mean so much to me to have you subscribe. You can do that by clicking on the link here. And don't forget to click the bell notification icon so you get notified of all my future uploads. Thanks so much for watching and see you soon.